And I will now give the floor to my co-convener, Professor Romuel Normand, who will chair the session and introduce today's keynote. Thank you very much, Esther, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Esther and Jiska, for the invitation. I'm very pleased to chair this uh, session and to welcome Elke van der Mekbruggen. I hope I pronounced the last name quite well. Uh, uh, she's a lecturer, researcher uh, in international teacher education at uh, NHL, Standard University of Applied Science in the Netherlands. She focuses on alternative results methods in education, and she's interested in the application of utopian um, speculative thinking, the punk ethos on anarchist organizational philosophy to reimagine educational policy and practice. And she will be discussed by Felicitas Malkebrist. Welcome to. Uh, Felicitas is Professor of Digital Education and Schooling and Research on Teaching, Explores the Cultural Politics of Educational Technology with a special focus on critical ethnographic and speculative approaches. And I'm very eager to listen to your lecture, Elke, and to learn more about punk ethnography. The floor is yours. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, and thank you for uh, people who are dropping in still or, or already found their way here. Um, so Esther Liska, thank you uh, for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, I'm familiar with the work of Felicitas as well. So um, for those who, you, who don't know Felicitas, it's really worth checking out her uh, work as well. I think there's lots of similarities between our interests. Um, I will... Uh, I think speak for about 35, 40 minutes, roughly. Um, and then uh, Felicitas will take over and add a commentary and then the floor is open, I think, for uh, questions. Give me just a minute to share my uh, slide deck. Uh, brings me back to pandemic times. All right, here we go. There you go. I think you should be able to see me, or at least the slide deck. Fantastic. It works. Perfect. All right. Um, the title of this webinar is also the title of a paper that I very recently published. And I'd like to ask uh, one of the uh, era uh, colleagues to maybe share the paper in the chat. Um, I'd like to invite you to share this paper wherever you want to read it. I don't think these things should be behind paid walls. Uh, and it also gives you a little bit more background in case you want to know more after this presentation. Um, this paper is part of a larger piece of work I'm working on at the moment. And it's largely conceptual, but there's also a very practical um, side to this, just to give you a little bit of a heads up in terms of what to expect. Um, Let's just dive straight into this. Uh, there we go. The world is in crisis. And uh, I'd like to invite you just to tune in and to immediately uh, tap, uh, tap your brain. What's your favorite crisis of the moment? Or maybe I should rephrase it a little bit. What's the crisis you saw this morning on social media or heard on the radio or have seen flying by? Um, in the latest newspaper, you can type it in the chat. You don't have to say anything, but maybe just to get an idea of uh, what kind of crises are we surrounded by? And it's a little bit weird to say favorite one, but one that stands out to you. There's a few things coming in. A crisis in the Ukraine, a crisis of corruption, a migration crisis, debt, yeah social justice crisis, uh, the crisis in um, Israel-Palestine crisis, science, hate. We're setting a good tone here. <laughs> yeah, you can keep adding uh, some of your crises if you want. Um, we are surrounded by crises. And basically, if you look at education, because education is one of the things that brings us together here today, there has also been a learning crisis. So, you know, migration crisis, environmental crises, crisis in, in, in Gaza. These things exist 
alongside what has been turned by bodies like UNESCO, like the OECD, in, in, in even in very recent publications, we're really surrounded by a learning crisis. And very often that refers to literacy and numeracy levels going down, you know, test uh, results not being um, at the level we would like them to be. So there's a real crisis discourse in education as well. What I like to do is interrupt the process of crises. And this is the big problem a lot of my work starts from. This whole notion of a crisis response, um, the way I see it is, and I'm using a quote here uh, by Cordero who says, well, crisis responses are not really tackling the underlying cause causes of an issue. It's an immediate quick fix Let's try and fix whatever we can and return to the status quo, to the state of affairs as soon as possible. So there's not really a, a structural longer term vision. And there's really very much a desire to keep things as they are or return to the normal. Um, that actually is very much the agenda point of conservative, more conservative oriented parties, organizations who really want to keep a, a kind of social stability based in the in the in the current moment, right? There's not really desire for transformation. The problem with that is that very often, therefore, social transformation becomes impossible, and the the issues with oppression, domination, inequality, uh, you name it, all the crises you've just mentioned in the chat, and I think they're still coming in as we speak. There's not really an aspiration to overcome those to to get, do away with them, to look for another way of moving forward in the future. Um, so that is very much kind of the driving force behind this particular piece of uh, paper, like, okay, if we're not engaged in crisis responses, how might we then exist in education, for example, if education also doesn't want to do that. My response is, and this is where I'm taking my cue from, um, the late anthropologist David Graeber, Graeber, he spoke of the importance of insurrectionary moments. I hope by the end of this uh, of this talk, it'll it'll be clear to you what that means. But just to give you a little bit of an idea, for me, it's very much an argument about creating autonomous communal spaces and situations where we can interact with one another, where we suspend the notion of power, because it's the powers that really very much, or the external authorities that control a whole larger other group of people who really maintain the status quo. So the purpose here is to push back, to move away from a crisis response and to really bring in the communities, the autonomy uh, of, of our communities and to suspend an operating of power. How will we do that? I hope that's, uh, that's gonna be clear as we move through this presentation. There are five steps to the argument here. The first step is I, will I would like to start with the very foundation of a lot of the people, of the work uh, of people in this room, is education. And I'd like to explore the notion of, of education as a hyper object. The second step, and that is also very much connected to the title of, of this presentation, is what happens when we look beyond the binaries of hope and despair? These two notions, or ontologies, if you wish, they're very much... Uh, driving forces in education, but also in our outlook on society in general. What happens when we when we overcome or look beyond those binaries? What is possible? That connects to step three, which is where I will talk about the radical imagination. For the radical imagination, after we've explored what that is, to be put into practice, I'm making a claim for, and this is step four, organizing ourselves according to an anarcho-syndicalist structure. And that brings me to the final step, uh, of this um, of this uh, argument is that then is what I would term as education uprising. So bear with me for a little while. Um, there are two quick questions that underpin the paper and also this um, this talk. What does the space beyond the binaries of hope and despair look like? This is all very nice, but what does it look like? How do we how do we organize ourselves? And what is the radical imagination? And what are the conditions for this to be put into practice in educational spaces? Step one is, as I said, looking at education as a hyper object. And I'd, I really like uh, using the notion of exploding education. Now, 
explosion, not in terms of let's bomb the schools and, you know, like smashing, smashing windows. That's not the idea. It's the idea of let's reimagine and rethink the concept of education, what we think it does and what it is and what its purpose is. But also let's bring education back into society. That for me is the first step that needs to happen. And I'm drawing very much on the work of, and I've got a book here. I don't know if you can see this. This is uh, very much an inspiration to me. It's the work of Timothy Morton. He is a philosopher uh, who wrote, who's been very prolific in his work. Uh, this book, particularly on hyper objects, was to me a, a very, I would say, a, a very provocative and very enlightening and enlightened way of looking at society. And so his definition of a hyper object, and I've got it in the slide here is, these are things that are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans. So what does that mean? We are, an object is so big and so vast and is existing across different geographical areas, but also across time that we cannot ever possibly put our finger on it. We cannot fully grasp it. And in his book, he gives uh, examples such as, um, uh, plastic garbage, for example. You, okay, you can see a plastic bag floating in the ocean, but the, it's not just the object of the plastic bag that we're talking about. We're talking about, um, you know, the material it's made of, the person who bought it, the supermarket or the shop where it came from, the current of the ocean, uh, the seasons, the time that that goes over... Um, um, uh, breaking the breaking down of the material. So it's such a vast thing. Another thing he talks about or another example he gives is the notion of global warming, AI, radioactive waste, capitalism is another thing. There's banks, there's people, there's money, there's policies, there's, there's a whole complex web of objects that are intertwined. And people are a little bit familiar with maybe complexity theory or systems theory will see some similarities. Now for him, for, for um, uh, Morton, hyper objects can be physical as well as mental objects. And I will not go into detail, but it's not just the, 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 the hardwired object in front of me. It can be a mental construct. And lastly, there's no away, there's no outside, there's no place outside you can go to escape a hyper object, right? So, so you're always, and he uses the term mesh, you're always in the mesh, you're always enmeshed in this. Now, if you accept this, if you roll with this idea for a minute, it means that we're always part of hyper objects, we're always part of capitalism, we're part of global warming, we are part of um, radioactive waste and so on and so forth. And we contribute to it, but it also means that we have a responsibility towards the hyper object. Now, if you take that notion of the hyper object and you look at education and see it as a hyper object, then Imagine for a minute, like what kind of objects make up the high project of education? Well, we're talking about schools, we're talking about teachers, we're talking about desks in schools, we're talking about policies, we're talking about test anxiety, which some of my students definitely suffer from. We're talking about the the conversations over the uh, you know over coffees that teachers have. We're talking about an incredible increasing number of objects, and this has been developing over time. So if, the, if education is a hyper object, it also means that we're never outside of it. We're never in spaces where education doesn't happen, right? It is, we are it, and it's a common good, and that very much also connects to certain traditions of thinking about education and critical uh, pedagogies and so on and so forth. It's a common good that emerges, expands, that changes where people come together. For me, this is a very, a far more interesting and useful way to look at education as opposed to the very centralized, institutionalized view we have of education, right? Today, when we talk about education, we usually talk about institutions, places that are walled off, literally, where people come together. They are controlled by a certain curriculum, an authority, a policy. They are jumping through hoops. People who are part of this educational space 
and somehow come out the other side educated. Now, my, my argument here is to completely park that idea and say education needs to be a decentralized common space. And it happens where people come together. And it happens over time in different spaces with different people. It can happen in schools, but it can also happen here today. It can happen with neighbors at dinner tables. So education is this hyper object that is part of our lives. And that's a very decentralized view on education, which is, again, I repeat the argument, very different from the reductionist view of education that we often have as being equal to school. Um, so if we accept this, if we say, okay, if education is a decentralized, um, vast hyper object that happens when people come together, it also requires a different way of organizing ourselves, right? Because there is no central authority that kind of tells us, all right, this is what we're going to do in this space of education. There needs to be a different way, a different way of organizing ourselves and opening up these spaces of education. And that is something that will become very important later on in this talk. So that's the first step. So you don't have to accept this, you don't have to agree with this, but it would be useful to roll with these ideas when we talk about education, because this is how I will conceive of education in the remainder of this uh, session. Step two is, what is this educational space beyond the binaries of hope and despair look like? So hope and despair are basically dispositions that shape our ontology. They shape the way we operate in life but also the way we operate as scholars, as academics, as teachers, as parents, as friends, right? We, we hope for something or we despair of something and that really drives our actions and our thoughts. Um, I very much like to look at the space beyond that, to move away from this binary and in this hyper-objective space of education and what becomes possible. And uh, for this, I've created, this is not very pretty, but I hope it does a job. I've created a something that is called a semiotic square or a grammar square. And it's it's not important to know where this comes from, but it is a um, um, a tool that is very often, a heuristic tool that's very often used in semiotic theory. And it is used to take apart binary thinking and to look at, to deconstruct it basically, but also to check what are the tensions? What are the limitations of binaries? And what lies beyond these binaries? And I very much, I got another book. This is the last one I'll, I'll pull up here. But I got very inspired by reading this book, uh, Haven and Kashnabish. The reference is also in this slide deck. They wrote a book these, uh, called The Radical Imagination a few years ago. And uh, Haven and Kashnabish are scholars and activists who've done a lot of work around social movements. And they created um, a semiotic square around success and failure. So the success and failure that social movements may or may not deal with. And actually their argument was, well, the problem is that we talk about success and failure and therefore limit the opportunity, opportunities and possibilities of social movements. So I got very inspired when I, when I read that and I, and I was thinking around this notion of hyper-objective spaces of education and thinking what drives us when we are doing the work of education in educational spaces, whatever it is, whatever our role is. And I landed with the concepts of hope and despair. And so what I'm going to try and do is take us through three different sides of, of this semiotic square to land in the bottom bit of the square where I think the real possibilities lie that connect to the paper, um, the paper of today. So let's start at the top. So I start from the concept hope and despair, right? Now imagine the top, the top um, part of the square is this is like our ideal state. This is the ideal society. We no longer have to hope. We no longer have to despair. We don't have a war in the Ukraine. We don't have a migration crisis. We don't have plastic floating around in the ocean. We live in a perfect world. In other, in other words, we have overcome all struggles and we have successfully achieved this society, this ideal world that, that uh, a group of people dreams of, right? 
in literature, this is very often uh, referred to as a blueprint utopia. And we've had examples of at least attempts uh, to reach those blueprint utopias from recent and, and further away history. For example, the fascist project, communist project, the capitalist project. So there have been examples and there are contemporary examples of authorities, groups of people who think we have a blueprint ideal vision of a society. We will overthrow an existing set of values, principles and authorities and we will put in place another authority or a set of values and principles that then creates this blueprint utopia. This is very much the idea of revolutionaries, right? Communist thinking, fascist thinking is a very revolutionary idea. We will we will overthrow the current authorities and replace them by an authority. Education in such a space becomes a very powerful tool of control because what you do is you actually use education to teach the masses about this ideal world and to make sure all noses are in the same direction. My maybe slight, maybe strong argument, my argument is we see this today in education. We have neoliberal authorities who really interfere with our curricula, with our policies in education to, and to get us in this mode of measurement, measurement of performance, of evidence-based practices, and as such, create, if you wish, very productive, very evidence-based, very progress-oriented subject. As you can see, my argument is this is very problematic. So I am not at all making a claim for a revolution in education um, for reasons just mentioned. So this is a problematic step, uh, um, side to think in. Let's then look at the left and the right side of this semiotic square. So on the left side, you see, all right, um, this is the hopeful side. It's fluffy clouds, pink elephants. It's a hopeful approach to education. We, we are bringing our students together and let's all pull together and we will, we will ultimately solve problems. The right side is the desperate side. It's really, it's the dark side. It's the doom and gloom. We're desperate. You know, there's so many crises. I think they keep coming into the chat. Where do we start? There's nothing we can do. We're just paralyzed by it. And whatever we do, it doesn't matter. So the argument I'm making here is both of these sides are actually kind of driven by crises, right? The, the hopeful people think, well, if we all pull together, if we all eat vegan food, clean plastic, uh, clear, clear the ocean from plastic, ban plastic straws, uh, I don't know, ride uh, electrical uh, vehicles, we can solve the problems of the world and, and keep things as they are and move on. My argument is, well, the, this is not really a response. This is going back to perpetuating the status quo in education as well. If you're doing uh, a beach cleanup, or if you're banning plastic straws with your school, you're very much wrapped up in this notion of fixing problems, right? Tinkering, do, fixing little problems, but maintaining the state of affairs. One of my pet peeves here, and I'm not gonna go too much into detail, but I'm gonna throw it in, is the issues that surround education for sustainable development, for example, ESD. When you there's interesting critical literature on that. For example, the work of Kopnina, I find really interesting, who really highlights and reveals this idea that education for sustainable development, if you look at the history and kind of the underlying dynamics, it's very much focused on economic growth. ESD isn't really about social transformation. It's built on the current state of affairs and very problematic Things. And yet we kind of take this on board in education and roll with this notion of ESD being a good thing. But it isn't a social transformation logic. It is simply a status quo. The right hand side, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but what you also see, and some of you who might be based in schools will, will see this in their classrooms, there's new pathologies called um, um, eco-depression climate anxiety, we have e even new streams in psychotherapy and counseling where students as well as teachers are counseled around eco-depression and, and, uh, and sorry, uh, climate anxiety issues. I'm not saying they're not real, 
But the problem is there's a there's a real sense of paralysis. There is a nihilistic view, and the view is whatever it, whatever we do, it doesn't matter. It's all hopeless, and it doesn't matter whether we're in schools or not. And this is also very often the reason why educators leave the profession. So what? So after all this uh, problematizing, criticizing, I do want to land at the bottom bit of the semiotic square where, where, and this is a, a term that I wish I had invented, but I, I didn't. It was uh, these wonderful people uh, of the book. This is the space where you encounter what Haven and Kashnabish call hiatus dwellers. So these are people who are not despairing. So there's not really a sense of despair. There's also not really a sense of hope. There is a being in the moment, in the messy, hyper-objective world that we're part of, and education is there. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, it, it, it's surrounded. We're surrounded by it. And it's in this space where you don't have revolutionaries. Right? There's no idea of overthrowing an education system and imposing another one. There's not a belief in some transcendental future where everything is perfect. There is, and I'm going to quote Haven and Kashnabish here because I couldn't, I can't say it um, as well as they do. This is a space where the hiatus dwellers are navigating the ongoing difficulties, pitfalls, and irreconcilable conundrums. So these are people who really, and that's a phrase by Donna Haraway, stay with the trouble. We are here. We are in the moment. We have all these crises that you have also posted in the chat, and yet we keep going. We are taking action with our communities, and we are going to organize ourselves, negotiate our values, work through the difficulties, not in an attempt to create a blueprint utopia. That's something that very often in the literature is referred to as a critical utopia, right? There is no belief in some future perfect land. The idea is we know things can be better and we are going to act upon this and try and create alternatives and notions of social transformation in the here and now. For me, this is the space where particularly in education things can be Yeah, This is the space where education becomes a space of possibility, not an ideal space, not a space that can lead us to some kind of revolutionary uh, future, but a space of possibility. And I do think it's important to do a little bit of that conceptual work to also compare and contrast uh, particular other attitudes, desperate or hopeful attitudes uh, in education. And that connects back to this idea of the hyper-objective view on the world, right? We are in the mess, we are enmeshed with the mess, we are in education, we are contributing to it and we are responsible for it. So how can we do this? We have to dwell in the hiatus, stay with the trouble. So that's the second step of, um, of the argument. And that brings me to my third step. This is great, right? Okay, I'm assuming you're, you're to, to some extent uh, in agreement with me, then the next question is, right, that's great. How do we do this? And this is where the notion of the radical imagination comes in. So this becomes actually an oper the operationalizing of our direct actions through operationalizing radical imagination. But what is it? And what conditions do we actually have to create to put the radical imagination to work? And this is, again, a little bit of, of conceptual work, but important work, I think. Um, when, we, when people talk about the imagination, also in, in classrooms uh, or even in, in scholarly work, very often there's this connection with things we do at night, when we dream. When we dream, we dream of, I don't know, perfect worlds or something we want to do. Uh, we imagine, you know, another house, another job, uh, a new pet. This is really not the, the notion of the imagination that I'm um drawing on here, I'm very much drawing on the work of Cornelius Castoriadis, who is a, um, a, a Greek philosopher who's also very much connected to the psychoanalytical um, tradition. And he speaks of the imagination as a collective practice. And I've put a quote by Chiara Botticci on the slide, but I'll try to paraphrase it. The idea is that the imagination is not 
just an individual thing. It can be something you do at night in your bed when you're sleeping, when you're dreaming of something, when you're imagining a holiday or, you know, a new job. But it's also a collective practice. Our entire society is basically shaped by our collective imagination. If you think about this for a minute, we, of course, have a physical reality, right? We have a hardware reality within which we exist. But a large portion of our society is completely imagined. Cultures, routines, laws, norms, policies, all of these things are the result of the collective imagination. And a very, um, a very tangible example is this. So I'm holding up a 50 euro note. This is, this is the result of our collective imagination. At some point over time, you know, and we're talking long time, we're talking generations and generations of people, we collectively imagine that this piece of paper has a value. And at some point we decided that the value is 50 euros. And then you can still ask the question, of what, what does that even mean, right? So money is a fantastic example of something that is collectively imagined. We individually imagine this is a thing, but this is the result of a collective imagination. So if we take that notion further, then the imagination as a collective practice is a very radical thing. Again, Haven and Kashnabish come come uh, come into the picture here. Something like money, and I actually contemplated this. Actually, someone in this room suggested this to me, and I thought, should I do this? I thought, I'm not going to do this. If we now, here in this webinar, which is also imagined, by the way, it's also the result of something that we've imagined, that this is a thing we can do. If we here and now decide, this doesn't mean anything. 50 euros doesn't really do much. I can just set it on fire and make it disappear. I did contemplate, I'm not going to do it, but in theory, I could do this. We could decide here and now, fine, we're done. We don't have, we're not doing this anymore. So the radical side of the collective imagination that is that if you accept that social forms are imagined, that they are the result of our imagination, the radical uh, realization is that any given at any given moment we can also reimagine something. We have imagined what school is today or what education is today. Well, we can also reimagine it. I am not claiming that's an easy thing to do, but it is a very powerful realization to know that we can reimagine school. We can reimagine how we live. We can reimagine what we eat. We can reimagine what we find important. And because in Central European time, it's 2.30, and I've been going on for a little while, a small interactive moment. If you take just a minute to think of a social form that is such a part and parcel of our lives that you like to see reimagined, which one would you choose? Which one? And I, you know, money, for example, is one that I would definitely like to see reimagined. Um, feel free to put it in the chat. I also, meanwhile... Drink a glass, drink a little bit of water. So what social form would you like to see reimagined is the question. Mine was money. No, it's a hard one. <laughs> no money, only love. Oh, I like that. That could also be a really nice uh, book title. Yeah, gender. I mean, there is, we can actually, we could say that there is a reimagining of gender, right? This is a, we're kind of experiencing a reimagining of gender roles in the, in the contemporary moment. Yeah, work would be a, yeah, work would be one that we could reimagine the way families function. What does it mean to have a family? Is it this nuclear little thing uh, with, with very traditional roles? Nations, uh, we're still living in a in a, an era where nation states are powerful um, concepts and aren't really at all reimagined and doesn't look like it will happen anytime soon. 
um, time. So you see how I think I think it would be hard to argue against the fact that these are the, the results, all these examples are the result of our collective imagination. And I would definitely add education to that. We've become so unimaginative within the space of education, while it is the thing that we've cooked up together, right, if you wish. And we're, 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 so we can recook it, we can change the recipe if we want. So that is very much the argument. So taking it back before I go um, into, into the next step, education is everywhere. We are, we are hosting it, creating it, managing it, changing it, where people come together. We know we have a radical skill, which is the power of the imagination. How can we then change things? How can we then reshape education? Um, and this brings me to oops, step four. It's a very difficult thing to do, right? We have billions of people on the planet. We work in large scale organizations. ERA is a good example. ERA is a network, but it, it's, a, it's a very good example of a hyper object as well. How do we do this? How do we, we don't want revolution. Right, we don't, and I like how people are still, still uh, imagining a different society just on the side in the chat. <laughs> That's fantastic. How do we do this? And this is where step four um, of five steps in my argument comes in. What are the conditions to put this into practice? Because let's be realistic. So many billions of people. We don't want a revolution. Where do we start? And this is where my argument will focus on bottom-up micro-political actions that are driven by. Um, the notions of cell governance, so no external authority that tells us what to do, is focused on mutual aid and solidarity. Ooh, I like wealth neighborhoods. Is this a, this could be a neighborhood? The era sociologies network could be a neighborhood. Um, so step four is very much how do we organize? How do we practically do this? And um, I do take a minute to to um, to unpack the notion of anarchism. I'm very much drawing on anarchist philosophy. Now that term needs a little bit of context. When I use the anarchism as a as an organizational and political philosophy, what I mean by that is, and this is a quote from Ruth Kinner, um, who who is a very useful, important, and very transparent scholar of anarchism. She says. Anarchism drives daily practices of liberation of peoples from political domination, economic exploitation, by the encouragement sorry, of direct or non-governmental action. So that's very much how I conceive of or perceive the notion of anarchism. I'm not going to do a talk on anarchism. I'm going to focus on something called anarcho-syndicalism, because remember, we're talking about how are we going to organize ourselves to put the radical imagination to work. Um, Anarcho-syndicalism is, is actually originates from the labor movement in the early 1900s. So just a brief snippet, you had uh, workers who started to uh, organize themselves in little syndicates to govern themselves and try and stay outside of the very oppressive and exploitative uh, practices of their employers, right? So it was very much, it came out of the labor's uh, movements. Now, what is really important here, that syndicalism, in the, in the term anarcho-syndicalism is very different from the syndicates, the syndicats in, in French or the unions in English that we know of today. Unions today are very top down. They're very much wrapped up in business, authoritarian, neoliberal logics. Not always, but very often. Syndicalism here is a radical grassroots bottom up idea. We are, if you wish, we could decide today with this group of 30 something people to create an anarcho syndicate, a community that has decided they have a shared purpose. They might disagree on various um, uh, aspects of, of what they're focusing on, but there is a commitment to changing something and to taking care of one another. And there's a real sense of solidarity and the prefix anarcho is very important. It works against centralizing power. So there will not be a chair of the anarchist syndicate. It will be a collective distributed um, 
uh, decentralized notion of power. Um, as an extra little bit of context, uh, the work of Rudolf Rocker, who was an important uh, anarchist um, who actually wrote extensively on the notion of anarchist syndicalism, gives a good kind of his work gives a good summary of, of, of what anarcho syndicalist organizations can do. They function against external oppressive authorities and allow for small groups to self organize and engage in mutual aid starting from direct action in the present. And we have examples of this in the contemporary moment. We have, um, um, for example, Occupy Wall Street, you know, with, with the financial crash in 2008, there was a social movement called Occupy Wall Street that uh, came into being Occupy Sandy after the, the, the Hurricane Sandy in, in the United States. I know there are a couple of people in this room who have, who've lived in Hong Kong, so the including myself, the umbrella movement in Hong Kong was a good example. The students, you know, going out on the streets, um, um, arguing for democracy. Some of these initiatives, some of the anarcho-syndicalist initiatives have failed, right? This is not necessarily a success story, but some managed to continue. Occupy Wall Street and various Occupy movements are still doing a job today. Some did a job and, and disappeared and just stopped altogether. But some move and shift in different directions, but these agile, flexible, self-organized, uh, autonomous, what I would call anarcho-syndicates are very much spaces where the radical imagination is being put into practice. People in those communities want social transformation. They imagine alternative social forms. And if that, if we were to say, instead of the classroom, instead of our you know, year one or, or you know, uh, senior year in secondary, we actually speak of our groups of students, of anarcho-syndicates. I'm not saying we shouldn't group them by age or whatever. I think we can have a discussion around it. But if we see them as anarcho-syndicates, the possibilities that then uh, emerge are quite incredible, right? But it, requ it requires organization. As a final kind of reminding us here of what this is about. I said earlier that a revolutionary idea is quite problematic, right? Because we just overthrow one authority and impose another. My claim is that external authorities, such as big ones we're all dealing with today, the OECD, national governments, the EU, re re regional organizations and in international education, you have organizations such as the International Baccalaureate. These are these organizations that have a very clear blueprint utopia in their heads, right? Um, they, they're for an evidence-based, uh, progress-driven, heavily surveilled education system. I'm arguing for insurrection or uprising, bottom-up, micro-political, community-based, and I'd like to use the notion of um, Haven and Kashnabish again, hiatus dwellings, self-organizing within our communities where education all of a sudden leads actually to the potential of creating social change. To conclude this, so actually, sorry, uh, so yeah, step five to conclude my little talk. Education for uprising is what happens in communities driven by self-organization, solidarity, participation, and those communities can actually re reshape social forms. And I'm going to give you two examples, and they are deliberately chosen from spaces that are not schools or not institutions. They're very brief because this is the end of my talk. Um, they come from the arts because together with, for example, um, Timothy Morton and people who write out of the space of object orient ontology, for example, spaces where artistic endeavors emerge have a lot of potential. So these are two examples that I, I'm not going to give you too much context, but just to say this could these could be examples of um, education for uprising. For this one, I have to play a, a little a 30 second um, snippet of a YouTube video. We've tested this before you all came in, so I hope um, this is still going to work. What I'm asking you to do is just listen. It's 30 seconds. Try and also listen to the lyrics. And also important to know, this is one person singing. Okay. Um, I'll keep an eye. So if someone can give me a thumbs up when they hear the sound coming through, that would be great. I haven't asked to play yet, but uh, a little bit of fiddling with tunes and yeah. Okay, here it comes. 
somebody hears you, you know that, you know that, somebody hears you, you know that inside, someone is learning the colors of all your moods, to show I'm going to stop here um, and pull my slides back up. This is, oh, there we go. This is Vienna Teng, and Vienna Teng is a singer songwriter. And she wrote this piece, I think it's 2013 or 2014. It's called The Hymn of Axiom. And I think you would agree with me that it's got this very religious feel and she's using a religious form called the hymn. Axiom is actually a data management company. And what she's done here is she's, if you look at the lyrics, I mean, I'll, I'll share the slides later. She's actually, she's making use of a vocoder, first of all. And a vocoder is a kind of, electronic instrument that can transform a human voice and through speech coding it can it can like give an output that sounds like a choir so this is her right solo running her voice through this vocoder and she sounds like a choir and it sounds beautiful and it sounds oh you want to you want to go to her church you want to go to her mosque you know you want to you want to, this is your religion however what she's doing she's actually critiquing these big data management companies for surveilling people on a permanent basis. I'm giving an example. It's my ongoing fight with this thing on my wrist, which is a Garmin watch. It's constantly reading my data. It shows that my, my heart rate is probably now 150 or something. You know, I am constantly giving data away to these companies. And this is the other big um, bit of critique from Vienna is we are also very slack. We are just giving away our data for free and thinking this is something very innocent whilst we are careless right we're careless individuals who are basically allowing companies like axiom to surveil us so just to 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 round up here this is a real arresting moment she's trying to arrest us as listeners by using technologies and tools that that are also used by others um, but it actually are doing something very harmful. Things we would agree on to be harmful. I would agree that Garmin, I'm, I'm selling my data for free to Garmin and yet here I am wearing the watch. So this is a real insurrectionary uh, moment. Final uh, example, and I think you will have seen this. Last month, this uh, street artwork popped up somewhere in London. I can't remember where. And it was the work of Banksy, um, Banksy, the famous uh, street artist, uh, once notorious, now everyone wants a piece of his art. Um, the interesting thing about the work um, from someone like Banksy, and there are many Banksys out there, is that what they're doing is they are basically using common space. And through street art such as this, they do not only disrupt a space, they also change a space. They critique the fact that, for example, in this case, green uh, communal spaces are less and less common. They're taking, they're, they're being taken over. But at the same time, he's bringing the green back in in a very kind of transformative, insurrectionary way, if you wish. So, and my cat is uh, coming in at the right time. This is an insurrectionary moment as well, if you wish. <laughs> So this is another example of self-organized, bottom-up groups of people, because Banksy is, is not a one-man operation, getting together and changing things, critiquing, but not just critiquing, actually cr actively creating something else. That, to me, summarizes the argument that I wanted to make today is what I would call education for uprising. It's a space where an awareness of difference can lead to new ideas, alliances, solidarities, and possibilities. That is where we can actually engage in alternative world making. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Elke, for this uh, fascinating uh, and provocative, you know, uh, lecture, uh, which uh, challenge our way of thinking about education and its future. Uh, so now I give the floor to Felicitas for a discussion around, uh, what, uh, 10, 10 minutes? It's okay? Yes, something like 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Elke, <clears throat> for this amazing talk and with also the amazing examples at the end, which, um, which are very moving and uh, visualise what you've been talking about. <clears throat> I think I'm losing my voice a little bit. I apologise for that. So I, I appreciate this talk and the whole approach very much. I read the paper beforehand, so most of the comments I'm making are referred to the paper, but it's the similar, um, similar to the talk. In, in basic arguments. So I think there's a fundamentally important critique of the crisis narratives that you're making here, because they don't, as you say, tackle the underlying problems. And at the same time, they strengthen the sort of conservative thing, the idea that we need to get back to some kind of stability. And you've, <clears throat> you've argued that you've argued that the with the semiotic square, which I find a really fantastic way to explore these issues, but the two sort of the left and the right side are pragmatic sides which are driven by these crisis discourses, either solving superficial short-term problems or paralysed by hopelessness. But both of these paths, maybe inadvertently, they reproduce oppressive educational practices. And then the paper explores ways of undoing this binary between hope and despair and, and exploring more radical ways of world making from a particular political perspective, which... I thoroughly enjoyed reading and listening to today. So three aspects jumped out at me and I tried to read across the paper, which and those three things I want to um, mention just now. And then I'll end with a couple of questions, which you don't necessarily need to answer straight away. But if I end with some questions while other people formulate their questions and then we can start. I'm sure there's lots of other questions and comments that want to be made from the other participants. So the goal of the paper starts right out and says, the goal of the paper is to cultivate alternatives that lie beyond the ubiquity of the crisis narratives that mark research, theory and practice in education. And how do we do this? We need to develop a radical imagination, drawing on that work that you've mentioned today, and that can drive insurrectionary moments. And one aspect that I find really crucial in this argument is that we can only cultivate alternatives if we first acknowledge the structures and systems of oppression, the violence, the exploitation and domination in which we find ourselves, the mess. I think it's really important that the way you did it today also in the talk to validate first the mess that we are in. Otherwise, it can end up with the danger of best practices in education where it looks like the solutions are too simple, but then we end up on the left hand side of your semiotic square. But acknowledging these oppressive practices in and around education is always only the first step. And the second step is to find ways of imagining otherwise. In that sense, I find this seminar today builds wonderfully on last month's seminar with Christina Brunilla, which focused more on the critique. And then here we can say, OK, what follows after the critique? What kind of research moves or try, tries to add on to that in a certain way? One premise underlying this attention to radical imagination is that we, if, we, if we imagine otherwise, then we can act otherwise. I totally buy into this premise. Some people may question that, but I think it's a very important premise. If we imagine otherwise, we open spaces, and I read this in your paper really strongly, to then act differently because the possibilities have been shown and the impossibilities have been shown that we can, that we can do. And key to this is, as you've said, that imagination is a collective practice. It's not something that happens in our heads. It's not the work of a creative genius. It's something collective, something we do. It's something we materialize in our practices. And there is, uh, despite what Margaret Thatcher says, who also makes an appearance in the paper, there is always an alternative. I like that. But this takes me to the second aspect that I want to highlight. Up, uprisings in the spaces of the everyday without scaling up. Um, if there's always an alternative, what is this alternative? What makes it successful? What makes it a failure? I want to read one sentence as well from the, another sentence from the paper. Elka writes, in many cases, these moments and activities have marginal chances of success. And often insurrectionists are criticised by those paralysed by despair, not hope. I would say also by hope, um, not despair, the problem solvers who do not see the point of action given the very unlikely, the very sorry, the very likely unsuccessful outcome. 
And this reminded me of a book that's been traveling with me for like 20 years, Clemencia Rodriguez, Fishers and the Mediascape. She argues there that the point is not whether citizens media is what she talks about, alternative media. The point is not whether they manage to change dominant media structures. The point is how they enable micro practices on the ground and how these micro practices on the ground are experienced as transformative and as democratic for those involved. I, I, I really appreciate that book. And I appreciate especially how you've taken up, I think, a similar idea, but Today, 20, more than 20 years later, when so many people measure success as the ability to scale up, to make something, to spread something across the whole world, I think it's very important to make this argument that, that Elka's piece makes, that scaling up is not the point. The point is to attend to the micropolitics of autonomous spaces of direct action in everyday life. And there's another sentence in the paper. The paper is interested in attempts to create the new in the shell of the old. And I love, I love the image that that brings to us. We, we're living in the ruins of industrial capitalism. We're living in, in on a damaged planet, as other work has, um, has suggested. But we have to create the new in the shell of this old in which we find ourselves. So this resonates also with earlier work. Your, Elka's own earlier work on Utopia as Method, drawing on Ruth Levitas, but also with Ernst Bloch's work on concrete utopias. I think they're also very specific and concrete and small. And Jose Munoz's work on critical utopias, which are also about the everyday, the practices. Um, and not about <clears throat> what Elka writes in the paper, the worst kind of utopia, the kind where the external authority figure, the revolutionary ideologue comes in from a position that they see as outside of the mess that they want to change. But if education is a hyper object, as Elka has argued, there is no outside to come in from. And I definitely agree, there's an irony in thinking that a revolutionary seizure of power can create an egalitarian society. If the means of grabbing power are not what you're going to do afterwards, then there's a conflict there, attention. But I do want, I don't, I don't want to give up the notion of revolution so quickly. Um, and if we read revolution through feminist theory, I found Francis Beale inspiring she wrote in 1969 to die for the revolution is a one-shot deal she says to die for the revolution is a, an easy commitment to make that i think is the ideological the, the revolutionary that you you're imagining in the paper but she says to live for the revolution means taking it on the more difficult commitment of changing our day-to-day -day life patterns and that's she keeps the word revolution but she reconfigures it to orient to this power of everyday moments and activities which is what i see as a key argument in the paper so, and that takes me to the, the third the third point I want to make. And that's, for me, one of the highlights in the paper is the way that Elka works with the notion of hiat hiatus dwellers. I love this idea of hiatus dwellers. The way that you work with it in this for education, yeah, where hiatus dwellers are neither revolutionaries. They don't believe in a transcendental future. They're navigating the, the, difficult, the difficulties of everyday life. They're not paralyzed. They're not trying to solve problems really quickly. They're, they're driven by immediate action it says in the paper, out of solidarity with their communities. So this living in between of future worlds and the mess we live in today and managing that, I think that's incredibly difficult to actually do and an incredibly powerful image. And, and as I was saying, that, that resonates for me with other work that uses a different vocabulary, but is thinking at the moment about how to accept the mess that we live in just now, the damaged planet, Anna Singh and colleagues' Art of Living on a Damaged Planet, or Stephen Jackson's Broken World Thinking. There's a German philosopher, Eva van Redeke, who talks about Bleibefreiheit and the freedom to stay. So freedom is not freedom to roam and to move and to travel the world and fly everywhere. It's the freedom to be able to stay somewhere because not everyone has that freedom. And that, and that sense of um, that sense of how to find new ways, how to use the radical imagination in your vocabulary to find different ways of living, of learning, of teaching, of, of educating in that sense. One other thing about hiatus dwellers, the Wiktionary, Wiktionary tells me that hiatus was borrowed from the Latin hiatus for opening and from io, which means stand open and yawn. And I love the idea of the yawn as part of hiatus. So that, that reminded me of like slow scholarship, of, of interrupting the academic capitalist machinery in which we find ourselves, of, of decelerating educational practice with the yawn in some sense. Okay, yawn is opening, right? But okay. And this hiatus, hiatus well, I think, is a beautiful evocative concept to, to think to think forwards with the way that you've brought it into education. So it not only, it shows how the article I find 
not only conceptualizes but also contributes to collective practices of cultivating alternatives to our current way of living. I do. I would like to end with three questions. Like I say, maybe, maybe you don't want to answer these straight away because other people, I'm sure, has lots of um of of questions and comments. One thing is about the the risks in the word insurrection, and the and the together with that, the conceptual relationship between insurrection, revolution, and utopia. I find that the article rejects revolution and utopia quite quickly. You put revolution in the image at the top, but I know that you've worked, Elka, you've worked with the concept of utopia before in a much more positive, like embracing way. And also the other side of that is um, what are the risks in, in the word insurrection? Saul Newman, who you refer to, he uses insurrection as a translation of Sterner's Empörung from German. And Empörung is exactly the word that's used just now for these new right-wing populist movements in Germany. So insurrection doesn't have a political direction to it. So there's a, I mean, the, we have conceptual, con, conceptual thoughts about those three words. I also wondered about history, the historization, how education for uprising, as you've called it, fits into or extends or transforms other approaches to anarchist or anti-authoritarian education, like Ferrer's Modern School or E.S. Neil Summerhill, which is the tradition I was educated in, maybe even Illich, and these things, that Judith Sousa's work on philosophy of anarchism in education, those things. And then the final question, maybe autonomy. Are there a couple of tensions in, in around, around autonomy? One, how to deal with the tension when Autonomy is is key to anarcho syndicalist. I think you talked about autonomous, um, but autonomy is also key to sort of liberal, neoliberal, libertarian understandings of twenty first century skills for education for the future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how do these different are these different senses of autonomy, or where's the overlap? Where's the difference? And then also autonomy and community, community and solidarity is so important to this approach. I think, and I'm be with a background with Foucault and Butler and stuff. Autonomy is always also subject always also subjectivation and that's not really autonomous so how do you deal with that community subjectivation and autonomy thing i think those last questions about autonomy are really classic questions act asked of anarchism but um it's a genuine question from me yeah. from my uninformed perspective so thank you again for the opportunity to engage in depth with your paper and with the talk and and thank you for the talk today Thank you very much, Felicitas, for the deep comments and questions. And Elke, if you could answer in five minutes, you know, or more or less, uh, to leave time for people not to get frustrated if they want to raise some questions uh, to your lecture. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Felicitas, thank you. I My reading list has just extended <laughs> massively. So I'm going to have to slow down and read more. So thank you for that. Um, I guess I want to start with your um, your reference to utopia and and you're right this is i'm very much uh steeped in in utopian thinking um and definitely didn't have the intention to reject the notion of utopia but it's a very complex complicated and nuanced concept to work through and i i felt like i would almost have to write another adjacent paper to this one to really you know contextualize what i do with utopia i think um just to kind of summarize how, how I view utopia, and it's very much connected to the work of utopia's method that I've done earlier, is utop someone's utopia can be someone else's dystopia and vice versa, right? So these, these two concepts are never uh, are never separate. Um, I think what is the real problematical uh, utopian vision is the blueprint utopia, right? The one that is imposed from an authority that actually uses and justifies oppression and domination because they have this ultimate ideal goal in mind. The fascist project is a really good example there. There's a Greek to this. And you would go above and beyond and, and use violence, uh, oppression, and so on to reach this point. Um, when I use the concept of utopia in a constructive way, and I'm doing still a lot of work around this, is seeing utopia as, and I think it's Ruth Levitas' own words, these are Levitas' own words, utopia as an activating presence. It comes from this idea that, and it also fits with work of Eric Owen Wright, for example, and, 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 and um, like-minded people, there is this notion that there is a better world possible. It's a plural vision. 
right? There is no singular utopia that lies out there. It's a plural idea that is different across different contexts. And it's the driving force behind our actions in the present. And that's very much this notion of utopia as an activating presence or a critical utopia. I think that's the notion I used in this, in one of my slides. It's we also are critical of our own utopias and constantly have to question them. We might try something today and you know what, decide next year or the year afterwards. This is has become harmful. Let's move on. So that would be my little... Um, kind of a sidestep towards utopia. Um, autonomy, classic question, but a valid one. You know, we, we are, you're absolutely right. I think uh, one of the taglines of the neoliberal uh, discourse is, you know, live your fullest potential, develop yourself as an individual, right? Which if you think about it, if we're all going to do this with 9 billion people on the planet, oh my God, you don't want to imagine this. So autonomy within my own work and very much in the work of people who who do operate in the space of anarcho-syndicalism is very much around being autonomous in the sense of not being governed by an external power. So the, the power, if you wish, lies with the group. But my autonomy is also a consideration of, of what serves the common good. Is are my individual actions appropriate and ethically responsible towards the common good? And I think that's where the notion of autonomy within my own work and the work of many anarchist, anarchist scholars uh, and activists for that matter differs from the neoliberal notion of autonomy. I as an individual, I can gather wealth, resources, develop myself regardless of the outside world with little consideration for the common good. And I guess that's kind of the, the answer I would give. Lastly, the notion of insurrection. I mean, it's a tricky one. And I had an interesting conversation a couple of weeks ago um, um, with, uh, with uh, colleagues from the Anarchist Studies Network, where we were talking about the work of Max Stirner. So Max Stirner is basically the anarchist of Ampuro. And there have been issues with the way that's wor that word has been translated. Uh, from German, because there was an English translation at some point with a very unfortunate uh, set of translations of, of uh, for example, the notion of empowering, but also the notion of singularity and egoism is the other uh, thing that people often take from Stirner. The problem is that then the notion of insurrection has other, as you say, Felicitas, political connotations today that are very often linked to the far right. I don't feel like I can give a very good short answer and I'm actually currently working on a completely separate piece, purely around the notion of um, insurrection, working through the work of Stirner. But uh, the one thing I would say here is that um, it really is about the work that happens in communities at micropolitical level. That is, in very simple terms, what insurrection and insurrectionary moments mean here. But I do agree with you that I have to work hard and have to be very careful with throwing out this notion of insurrection into a space that might take it somewhere else, um, into a direction that I don't think is uh, politically responsible or ethically responsible. So that's kind of a non-answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elke. So we have some comments, long comments on questions. Uh, 